Thank you. All right. Good evening, everyone. Sean Olson, Fire Marshal for Clackamas Fire District Number One. Uh, this evening, I'm going to go over some fire prevention and home fire safety uh, education with you. Answer any questions that you may have. We're going to discuss uh, home escape plans, smoke alarms, fire extinguishers, and in the end, we'll go over the fire file of life, and I'll provide that to you when we're done. So, all right. Just to, again, go over the objectives. Um, we'll also talk about fire extinguishers, the different types, uh, ones that are most effective for use within the, within the home. Um, understanding which smoke detectors to use, when to check them, how often to check them, exit drills in homes, practicing two ways out, um, and then learn a little bit about the history of fire prevention. So approximately 3,300 people die annually in house fires, and more than 17,000 people are injured. Uh, due to home fires, um, this number has seen a decrease over the last few years because of uh, the implementation of an American Burning document, which was put out in 1970 by that current presidential administration. Uh, there was a need that it was identified that fire prevention was very important and was needed because there was thousands of people that were dying each year across the country and the, and the world. Um, and the need for fire prevention and education was very important to try to bring those numbers down and reduce the outcomes. So currently, there is roughly about 120 firefighters that are killed each year um, in, on the line of duty. This is mainly for single family homes um, where most of us live in. Uh, they're generally each year are natural disasters combined as well. But for tonight, we're really focused on home fire safety around the home um, and where we can do uh, prevent some of those things from happening. Um, Based on current numbers, we're seeing about $8.6 billion a year in loss um, due to home fires across the country, which has seen a decrease over the years, but um, we're still kind of trending on a neutral playing field with that, with still having the need to do aggressive fire prevention work to try to reduce some of those losses. A little bit of facts about fires. Um, previous fires in our earlier homes, which we call legacy homes, we had furniture that was made up of actually natural products such as cotton, uh, wood. Those fires do not spread nearly as fast as some of our newer homes and newer furnish furnishings that we have. Uh, the difference is, and what dramatically affects fires, is the synthetic material that is placed within either our couches, our carpet. Um, everything, when it's ignited, burns like gasoline when it becomes lit. So it's an extreme, creates an extreme fire behavior and creates rapid fire growth within seconds if we do have a home fire in the newer homes. Um, now, if we have a, a home that has, I don't want to say outdated furniture, but you know, the furniture that's got like really the big, huge, fluffy pillows and the flower um, di uh, decor, um, things that are of probably 40, 50 years old, you could probably put a match to that and the fire will just sit there and not do anything. But you do that with like say an Ikea couch or something like that, where it's got the styrofoam in it, that thing's gonna rip like a used pour gasoline all over it in a matter of seconds. So the heat and smoke also that is being produced from those uh, synthetic materials is extremely toxic. Uh, carbon dioxide levels it go elevated, making your environment uh, unattainable, you will not survive in a type of that type of a fire. Your oxygen levels will deplete down to five, eight percent in a matter of seconds, making that room completely unsurvivable. Back in the day, you could probably be sitting in a living room for probably three to five minutes and still be okay. And just basically watch your fire grow and develop inside that room. Nowadays, you've probably got less than 30 seconds to get out of that room, otherwise you're not gonna survive. Um, asphyxiation is the number one killer of home fires. It's not so much the direct fire contact, but when we're sleeping and if we don't have working smoke alarms, the smoke and carbon dioxide will attack us first. And basically you won't even know what, you, what hit you. So um, if you've got working smoke alarms, they'll detect early, get you out of the house quicker. But nowadays with the fires being so aggressive and much faster, um, your likeness of a surviving without working smoke detectors is very, very slim. Um, statistically, 84% of all civilian fire deaths do occur in residents. So just a little bit back, going back from the fire prevention, um, 
outreach, uh, America Burning was that key document that was kicked out. It's about a three or 400 page document, which took an analytical approach to what and why people are dying in fires. Um, and from that, uh, America has developed and all across the world has developed very extensive and robust fire prevention programs, uh, which is ultimate goal is to reduce fire deaths and injuries through public education and outreach. So part of what we're going to be doing tonight is part of that. Just 40 years later, we're still doing it. So some of the three key points to fire prevention is the engineering, education, enforcement, and we tack on investigation to that. And so my idea with that, with the investigation end of it, is when the engineering, say building construction, fire accidents, water supply, when that has failed, um, we go to the education side and we educate people how to be fire safe. And if we can't get enforcement, like if we're doing building inspections um, throughout the community, we go to the enforcement side to gain fire code compliance to reduce that risk. When all those three things fail, we get a fire. Now we're into investigation mode and try to figure out what caused that fire. Um, Right now, our, our fire prevention month for October for the National Fire Protection Association is uh, cooking fire safety. That's the number one cause of cooking fires across the country. Um, but when we do have cooking fires, we can go and investigate it. We create that data points, whether it's a cooking unattended. Um, we have that data. We go back, loop back through to the education portion, and it's just kind of a vicious cycle of how things work with the investigation. So all four of those are tied to part of the public education and outreach programs. Um, some of the priorities when we're looking at home fire safety is one is prevention of fires, working smoke alarms, planning and practicing home escape plans. Just a little bit of fire chemistry here. You need three things to have fire is oxygen, heat, and fuel. You take any one of those objects away, you don't have a fire. So that, is, that term has been in place for 100 years. It's the most simplest of concepts of how fire is developed and how fire is sustained once it does get burning. So within a home, say for instance, we go back to our couch example. Someone is smoking a cigarette, they drop the cigarette in between the cushions of the couch. The fire now has an ignition source, which is your smoking, smoldering material of the cigarette. It's got a fuel load, which is the uh, tobacco plus now a highly flammable synthetic material of the couch plus it's got oxygen which is in that environment in that room so you got all three of those things you're going to have a huge rip and fire but you come in there and you introduce a water source so you take a, and you cool the fire you're taking away the heat which is going to extinguish it if you were able to cover it up or smother it you're going to take away the oxygen um, or if you were to take the couch out of the, out of the house and let it burn outside, now you've taken it out, the fuel out. So that's kind of just in a nutshell of how uh, the fire tetrahedron works and how we have fires. Um, so we'll get in a little bit of the fire safety tips to keep you safe. Um, like I was saying, this month and every year in October, the National Fire Protection Association identifies a new, new uh, fire prevention slogan, which this month is cooking safety. Um, cooking safety still happens to be one of the biggest causes, leading causes of home fires across the country every year. Um, we're still, and the reasons for it is the number one is unattended cooking and walking away from it. Um, I have been guilty of it and come back and I have burned my food, but luckily I have not had a kitchen fire myself. But, you know, when we do forget, this is what's really what's causing and burning our houses down. Um, a couple other key components with it is now that we're going into the fall time, we've got our wood fireplaces that we're going to start kicking up again, our wood burning stoves, um, portable space heaters if you've got it and you use them, is keeping those 36 inches away from any combustible material. My experiences as an investigator for the fire district, um, the wood burning stove one is super critical, is making sure that your chimneys are cleaned prior to firing them up because over the years, if you haven't cleaned or have a chimney sweep come through, the creosote material within that chim chimney creates a very thick layer of creosote, which is fuel. And you've got a fire ignited into the firebox of the wood stove. And if you get it hot enough, it will ignite that creosote. Now you've got a chimney fire blowing up out your roof. Um, 
so having it clean is very preventable. Uh, it's, it's preventable from keeping a fire from occurring within the chimney. Um, portable space heaters, um, keeping those against uh, or away from any loose light combustible material like paper, newspaper. I've seen numerous fires in my career caused by paper, newspaper uh, being too close to, to uh, these heat sources such as wood stove and portable heaters. Um, another cause of fires with portable space heaters is overloading uh, power strips. So portable space heaters can put off about 1500 watts of power if you've got it turned up all the way. If you're going out and you're going to, I don't know, say you're buying a super inexpensive power strip from Dollar Store or something or Dollar General, uh, those ratings of those power strips, I know positively do not support 1500 watts of power. And if you've got that plugged into a really cheap power strip, and then you have another appliance plugged into that power strip, your failing point is gonna be that power strip. It's gonna overheat it and it's gonna melt and you're gonna cause a fire. So it's drawing too much energy through that power strip and what, what, what that can withstand. Um, if you have any damaged or loose electrical cords around the home, if you're splicing them together because you just want to save money and you want to save your extension cord that you've reused over and over and over again and you, you think it's still good, get rid of it because every time you have a cut or a crack or uh, the protective covering is, that's protecting that wire is brittle, you've got weak points within that extension cord. So it's not worth it. Get rid of it. Quit trying to fix it. And I've been guilty of it over the years, but not anymore. I've kind of learned my lessons. So... Um, smoking. Um, smoking in years past um, still is one of the top five key uh, home, phone, home fires. Um, there has been significant strides within Oregon over the last 20 years of developing fire safe cigarettes. The state of Oregon was on a huge campaign for quite a while and they were able to get into administrative ruling that the only cigarettes that can be sold in Oregon are fire safe. And the intent there is if the cigarette is dropped, if it's not being puffed on, it doesn't have enough energy and it won't start a fire um, on anything. So I think it's not, I don't know if it's 100%, but the effort was there and it did reduce the amount of fires that we did see in Oregon for uh, fire safe cigarettes. Another key one that I've seen uh, numerous times within our fire disc is unattended candles. Uh, I just had one the other day. Um, things like this, it's not a matter of if it's going to happen. It's going to be when the fire is going to happen if you leave a candle unattended. Sometimes you'll get candles, again, that are like a dollar lesser value, <laughs> that are the super cheap ones that really don't have a good protective uh, glass or anything that creates that barrier between your combustible material and the candle wick itself. It'll eventually burn down and then that candle wick will ignite the loose combustible material, especially if your candle is sitting on paper. Um, just had a fire a week ago uh, that happened out this out in Redland uh, because of an unattended candle that wasn't blown out. The candle was lit the day before. The fire did not occur though until the following morning at around 10 o'clock but it was very clear based on fire patterns that that's where the fire originated was from where the candle was. So it takes time. Okay, um, and just, just to go over a couple of the fire safety things around the home, just to be more awareness for, um, again, kind of goes back to the uh, unattended cooking. So microwave, same thing, if you, if you give it too much time, and you burn your food within the microwave, that can start a fire. Um, le lighter left on the counter, if you have kids, they can play with matches, play with lighters. We've seen that before many times also. Um, matches left in the drawer, same thing. I think the intent with this image for that is, is with having children around the home, is keeping things up high that kids can't play with ignitable uh, matches and, and lighters. Um, if you did need a fire, or fire extinguisher, making sure that it is charged, making sure it's readily available within the kitchen, um, not leaving it empty. Uh, if you do have a, an empty fire extinguisher at home, um, or if the gauge is not in the green anymore, sometimes it's cheaper just to go buy a new one versus have it, take it in having it serviced or recharged. Home Depot or Lowe's, Home Depot or Lowe's has plenty of fire extinguishers. Um, 
Commonly, I've seen uh, light, loose combustibles like paper towels near a toaster or near the oven that's going to cause a fire. Um, electrical hanging in the sink uh, that can arc, especially if it got wet and the breaker didn't trip and it doesn't have that override on it. The breaker um, or the quid cord should could short circuit as well the coffee pot. Um, heat too high, I've been guilty too. Heat too high, especially when we're using grease and it's off gassing and it turns into, if you've ever seen it, which we probably have, but if you get oil too hot, it eventually starts emitting like a black smoke. And then it's almost to that point where when you do see the black smoke that what we call is at its ignition temperature. So when oil reaches a certain temperature and a telltale sign is when you're starting to see that really thick black smoke, all you need is a few more seconds and that will auto ignition and burst into flames. Um, what else? Um, and everything else kind of self-explanatory. Okay, um, chemicals in the home and garage. Um, all of this stuff to me in, in my world as, the, as an investigator is a fuel load. I mean, this stuff isn't gonna cause a fire, but it's gonna help support a fire and it's gonna create that fire behavior that's gonna be extreme. It's gonna fuel it. Um, so making sure that these items are stored within a safe place, not cross-contaminating, cross-mixing uh, certain chemicals, you got approved containers, locations that are not accessible to young children, um, putting things in like your um, flammable liquids or aerosol cans into a flammable liquid storage cabinet, which is self-closing. Those are rated appliances, so they, they automatically close and they'll withstand some level of direct fire. Um, so the fire doesn't escape out inside that of a storage container. And again, accessibility, just making sure things are, are out of the way and not accessible to young children. Um, another thing around the home, I apologize, this is not a picture of the home, but the point is um, having excessive things in the home. Um, we see numerous fires every year in our fire district um, with excessive boxes, material, um, food, everything spread out throughout the entire house. The biggest part with that is one, it blocks, has the potential to block your escape route. The biggest part though, is you do have a fire, you have no way of getting out of your home and your fire spreads doubles in size in seconds, especially when your home is completely cluttered with a lot of things. Um, when it comes to stuff like that, that's kind of where we just provide that education to homeowners. We have no authority. We can't tell them to change it. Can't say one word with it, but that's, you know, that's their environment. That's where they live. And um, the hard part is we do get fires like that. And sometimes people don't make it out because they have no way out because they have too much stuff. Um, blocked exit kind of falls under that same, same idea. Um, not just exit doors, but also exit windows. Things, boxes stacked up covering up your windows. Those are your escape routes. Every home is required to have two escapes. Your main primary, if you're looking at a bedroom, you've got your main door coming in and out, and you also have an escape window. So you're required to have two exits. Um, but if we're blocking that with stuff, it eliminates that secondary exit. Uh, we touched a little bit already on power strips, extension cords. Um, open junction boxes around the home. Um, if, if some of us like to do our own electrical wiring and we're self-proclaimed electricians and, and we're doing work that's not permitted, um, sometimes you run into that risk factor of doing something that's going to overload a circuit or we're not going to tie the nuts appropriately and it's going to arc and it's going to create a, a weak spot uh, within that connection that could eventually start a fire or have the potential to start a fire. Um, splice wiring, where we're talking about trying to, hey, I cut my extension cord accidentally, I'm going to splice it back, back all together with all these wire nuts, and then I'm going to wrap it with electrical tape. Well, that's great and all, and it probably will work for years, but there'll be that time where it, it doesn't work and it has a fail point because we failed to tighten the, the wire nuts on appropriately, or um, it's more damaged than what we thought. Now we've created a heat point where electricity passes through and creates more, more conductivity, and more of a heat, and then finally bursts into flames and ignites, especially if we're overloading that circuit through the extension cord. So ultimately, it's just best just to get rid of it, get a new one. 
this is a very, very common, um, extremely common fire code violation um, that we see while we're out doing inspections. Um, this is also common within residential homes that we've seen on some fires. Um, but the point is when we daisy chain these or we piggyback power strips together, so for instance, say that this black cord there is tied to a 1500 watt portable heater. Okay, so follow that cord over and it takes off up to the left. We've got another appliance there plugged over that way. Say that's going to a mini refrigerator. So right there, you've got close to 1500 or 3000 watts of power pulling through that one power strip. Now you've taken that power strip and you've plugged it into this power strip. Well, that's 3000 watts going into that power strip. That power strip also, strip also has three other appliances plugged into it. So 3000 and hypothetically say 500, 500, 500. So that's 1500, so 4,500 watts. And the power strip, it may be only be rated for 1500 watts. So we're already clearly overloading that circuit or that power strip. But it's not finished because now that power strip is plugged into the wall outlet, which is 120 volts. Now you've got all that working load going to that one outlet, which isn't rated for that. And you have a potential fail point there. So it's all a vicious cycle. To solve that problem is you unconnect, disconnect that, plug that power strip directly into another outlet, and plug that, plug that power strip into the same outlet that it's plugged into. So you minimize that amount of circuits, amount of wattage going through that one power strip. Okay, a um, little more into uh, heat producers. Um, every heater is required uh, to be UL listed within the US. Um, when we're out doing inspections, what we're looking for is that UL listing. We're also looking at to see if you knock that heater over, it shuts itself off. So it's got tip over protection. The old ones like that one used to buzz at us uh, when it was knocked over. Um, but I don't think they do that anymore. I think they just shut off. So at a certain degree, I believe it's around 35, 45%, the heater will shut off automatically and cool off. Um, Let's see, dryers, uh, just quickly on this, that's another um, potential fire source is not cleaning out our dryer vents regularly. So depending upon how often you do dry clothing, um, it's amazing how quickly, and we know, have seen, uh, how much lint can be built up really fast, especially if your dryer vent is kinked, bent all different directions, and it's not directly venting straight out to your vent to the exterior. If you've got kinks, any type of 90 degree kink in it, that's a buildup point for your lint. If you've got um, anything that's clogged, like mice or rats coming into it, laying nests, you've got another issue there. Um, but what that will do to your um, dryer, the fire won't start in the duct, it'll start within the compartment of your dryer. So your, your heating element of your dryer will eventually get lint built up on it. And over time, it will eventually ignite because it's self-heating itself every time it goes around and it'll self-ignite and eventually light off your lint. So keeping it clean all the way back to the dryer is super important and then all the way out to the exterior. Um, a little more on smoking. Um, so I unfortunately over the last 16 years have probably seen, I've had three fires, three fatalities because of smoking. Um, and it's, you know, typically there's also a, another influence that why somebody had fallen asleep while they were smoking, either they were drinking or they passed out or from what I have seen. Um, but smoking, um, has been the number one cause for fire, fire fatalities for a very long time. Um, the biggest part with that is people smoking in bed and with our bedding material, the super lightweight um, cotton material or synthetic material mainly, people will smoke in bed, watching TV, have a couple drinks next to them, pass out, cigarette will fall onto their bed and of course they won't know it, the fire will ignite and having that smoke and that toxic fumes next to them so quickly or so close, they're inhaling that in and that carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, all those chemicals of combustion 
will knock you out and you won't even know what hit you. So, um, and just a couple safety things there, um, you know, not smoking when you're drowsy, uh, using heavy duty ashtrays. Um, we've had fires where people will go outside, out to their back deck, have a couple smokes, throw it into a cardboard box. Um, seen that many times or a plastic uh, garbage can with a plastic liner, flick it in there and it doesn't happen every time, but eventually it will. Um, fire will just slowly um, develop within that ashtray or within the uh, trash can and then move up the side, move up your siding and take your house out. So it generally occurs later in the evenings. There's been numerous times where I've had conversations with people like, well, what time were you out here last smoking? Because you can clearly see the fire patterns coming from that, at, from that trash can, from the deck trash can to the side of the house. And like, oh, I was out there like around eight o'clock. There's no way it could have been that. Well, your fire occurred at 3 a.m. Your fire pans were directly right to here, pointing me right to the trash can. There's nothing else there. Either you started it on purpose or you threw a cigarette in there and it finally combusted and ignited and took out your house. So generally, most of the time, that's the case in what happens um, with smoking. Um, and just an ironic case, with oxygen and smoking, um, the person was injured, but it didn't kill the person. They were smoking on their living room couch, watching TV, fell asleep. They were on supplemental oxygen with the nasal cannula that goes up in your nose. And it was low flow, it was like seven um, liters per minute. Um, fell asleep, their cigarette fell onto their stomach, onto their clothes, landed on their oxygen tube, ignited their oxygen, and because the oxygen is coming from a different direction, which flows this way, it backtracked and took out the oxygen tube all the way back to the oxygen appliance, which was in their bedroom about 30 feet away. It was the craziest thing I've ever seen. It didn't hurt the person, maybe a little just because of the smoke inhalation, but the nasal cannula burned off like right here and it just traveled all the way back and didn't have enough energy to ignite their house on fire but just burned the carpet all the way back to the unit. Craziest thing, like what the heck? <laughs> um, so um, luckily it self extinguished itself because it ran out of fuel because I think it made it to like vinyl flooring and that was it, but didn't go anywhere. So with the holidays coming up, um, it's has been a while. I don't want to say it's like a huge fire problem, but it does occur. Um, we have seen fires related to Christmas trees. Um, not so much candles within the last 10, 15 years. That's just kind of tapered off, especially around Christmas time and Thanksgiving. Um, but what mainly has been the issue with uh, Christmas trees and the holidays is having your Christmas tree way too close to a combustible, to a, to a heater, to your wood stove, um, especially when it starts drying out. And it only takes a week or so for it to start to dry out. But then when it gets to the point where the needles are falling off, time to get rid of the tree. But um, having your trees too close to uh, a heat source that has the potential to ignite it has been the biggest problem that we have seen, and especially across the country. Every Christmas light now, every string lao is UL listed. They're, they're low energy. I haven't seen um, or have not heard of many causes of fires because of Christmas lights, because they are relatively safe now, being LED, so much, much cooler temperatures. Um, but the circumstance that I have been a part of was the Christmas tree was too close to the wood burning stove, which was, I mean, come on, like, really? <laughs> but it also impeded somebody's exit path because say the, the wood stove was here, Christmas tree was here, main exit door was here. Well, people were trying to come out and escape this way. Well, they couldn't because the Christmas tree was too close to the exit. And if you've ever seen a Christmas tree burn, um, it explodes like it was a gasoline. Um, and so if that's in your house, your escape time is almost zero to go out the way out your main exit. So you've got to find another way out. Um, this was just, just a, um, a quick snippet. We've done live burns before with Christmas trees just to show how dynamic they are. And if you ever jump on YouTube and pull up Christmas tree burn, 
they go up in a matter of like not even seconds. Um, this was probably a matter of like one to two seconds and it, it takes off, especially if it's dry. Okay, uh, we'll go over some home exiting within the home. Um, so, we touched a little bit on it, but our primary exits are generally the ones that we use every day. So the main front door, your bedroom door, um, your basement door, your primary is always something that your mind, if there's an emergency, is gonna think of the first place to go. And that's generally the case for almost everything we do and every building we're in. Like we go to Safeway, our mind is gonna think that we're gonna go out the front door that we came we're not instantly gonna think, well, I'm gonna go out the back door because that's the second way out. We're gonna to have to consciously think about that and go out the back door. Um, the home is no different. So if our means of egress is blocked due to fire, we have to subconsciously think for a few seconds that our other exit is gonna to have to be something else. It is either gonna be an exit window um, or another door out the other way. Um, Secondary exits are generally what I was just saying. So windows are generally secondary exit. Um, another door in the opposite direction of where your main primary entrance egress is. Um, trying to think of anything else in the home. I think that's probably about it. Um, windows and other exit doors, but um, just keeping in mind, and that's where we kind of go into the idea of practicing escape routes is very important and just getting into that habit of having that uh, redundancy and, and drilling on your own home so that your, your mind is melded with the fact that if you're, this exit is blocked, your instantaneous next thought is your second exit. Um, okay, so practicing having two ways out is very critical. The other big part to it is having a safe meeting place. Numerous times have we been on fires that families will split. They'll go out different directions. Um, and there might be reasons for that. The, the fire might be between the kids here and the parents are over here and the fire's right here. Then, yeah, you're gonna split, go different ways. But the key part is coming out and meeting at the exact same location so everybody is accounted for. It's, it's personal accountability um, and making sure that everybody is, is accounted for. Because if they're not, we don't, one, don't wanna go back in. We've had numerous people die with from fires, people going back in, going back in for their cats, going back in for their dogs, um, for kids. Um, firefighters need to know how many potential victims that they have inside so they can plan accordingly and they can plan instantly. Um, complicating things is, is not staying together, not being accountable for each other, reporting to our command staff when they show up, hey, this person's trapped inside. They're gonna wanna know where that person is, where the location, what floor, what bedroom, any description that you can provide, um, the better the response for the fire crews and quicker they can get out of the occupancy. Uh, a number of years ago, we had um, a fire up in Happy Valley. Um, there was exa this exact same thing that we're talking about is, is the occupants escaped. One was still stuck inside. They went straight to command. So this person is stuck in the northeast corner bedroom. The crews knew exactly instantly where that was. Fire's venting out of every window in this entire house. Totally unattainable. But uh, the crews reacted quickly. They acted, reacted without hose streams. They went, went straight into search mode. They laddered the second story building, um, went into the bedroom where that person said this other person was. The bedroom door was shut, which we'll talk about here. Bedroom door was shut. There was no flames in that room. As soon as the crews made entry into that bedroom, not even like two, three seconds later, flames started to burn through the top of that door. So they had not plenty of time, but they had time to evacuate that person out the second story window, putting them over their shoulder, putting them on the ladder, lowering them down. Amazing rescue, absolutely unheard of because the second, the last firefighter was leaving that bedroom door, the fire was ripping through that bedroom and within a few seconds later, after they had just made out onto the ladder, that room went to flashover where everything ignited into flames. So it was an amazing rescue. It went, they got huge awards for it nationally and was pretty cool to hear. 
especially the radio traffic listening to it. Um, but again, just having a safe meeting place is super important, uh, especially if it's in the middle of the night and being accountable for everything. Um, address visibility. We don't probably have too much of a concern within city limits. Most of our homes are clearly addressed, but that if they're not, it's very important to have addressing that is very visible from the front door, the garage, or the mailbox, um, because seconds count, especially if there's a fire or any type of a medical emergency. Rural community um, is pretty good, but the amount of time that fire crews take to leave the apparatus or leave the fire station to get to a rural address may be seven to 10 minutes. So if they're having to search for an address sign and that's not visible at the street, they're just chasing their tails around trying to find this place and it's, it's wasting a whole heck of a lot of time. So having visible addresses is very critical and important. Uh, go back into the meeting place. Uh, a meeting place isn't right next to the house. A meeting place is 25 to 50 feet away. Public street mailbox is generally a good location um, out near the street. It's a great spot where incident command and the firefighters can visibly see people standing there and waiting and they're accounted for. Um, and once you do, then you call 911. Don't call 911 when you're trying to get everybody out of the house. Call 911 when you're out of the house and you're safe. Smoke alarms. Uh, we'll go over the different types, locations, the audibility, and a little bit of the maintenance of them. A um, Couple different types. So we've got the battery powered ones and the new homes nowadays have the hardwired ones. Uh, the battery powered ones are generally, if one goes off, that's the only one that goes off. The hardwired ones, one goes off, they all go off. So it really wakes you up, which is a benefit. Um, we do have um, hearing impaired smoke alarms, which they have a voice activated um, alarm and they'll basically state fire, 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 um, which is super great. And they also have, uh, I think the same ones also vibrate. So we'll generally help citizens out by mounting these next to their bed, plug it into the wall, mount it next to the bed, and they've got battery backups on them. So if it does detect any smoke, it'll vibrate the bed and you hear the vocal voice notification. Do you guys have any questions? I should have asked that a long time ago. Not yet? Perfect. Okay, um, locations. So most important is sleeping rooms, and this is code. Code language states you'll have smoking smoke alarms in every sleeping area. You will have one outside the sleeping room, which is in the hallway. You'll have one on each floor. So like if you got sleeping on one level, you have a basement, no sleeping, just a common room or something, you'll have one smoke detector down there. But all the sleeping rooms will have them. Um, we're not recommending, you can, but you place them in the kitchen, laundry room, bathrooms, fireplace, stoves, that's where you're gonna get your nuisance alarms and that's where people take the batteries out and they're worthless anyway. Um, but new construction code, residential code, does not install smoke detectors in any of those locations because of that reason and we don't wanna encourage, discourage people from pulling the plugs, disconnecting them. Um, they're preferred on the ceiling or wall. Um, I'm sorry, they're preferred on the ceiling, not the wall, because heat and smoke travel up. Once the smoke hits the ceiling, or regardless of the, the orientation of the ceiling, once it hits it, it'll start to bank down. Um, so like for like this room, for example, like even for your own home, if you place a smoke detector in here, your best location is up at the top section of it about four inches away from the peak because uh, let's go do bad example go to an a-frame so if we take an a-frame structure with vaulted ceilings and we place a smoke detector right up in here sometimes there is air movement within the top there that's not going to allow smoke to hit that smoke detector in a quick fashion you place the smoke detector four to five inches below that peak, smoke travels right up along it and hits it immediately. So there's void spaces. This is a bad example because smoke would travel right up in there and hit it, but 
think of an A-frame and is the best location. If you do have to mount something on the wall like that one, it's generally four inches below the ceiling line. Um, if we go any longer, so like these ones that are in here that look like they're mounted probably about 26, I don't know, 36 inches below the ceiling. The problem with that is, and those were installed per code back when the building was built, now that smoke has time to build up in this room, and if the smoke has time to build up in the room, the fire has time to develop. So it creates a way more unattainable uh, environment for the people who are in it. So the higher up, the quicker notification, the quicker you can get out. Uh, let's see, should be audibles in all sleeping rooms. Um, if not, throughout may need interconnected smoke alarms. Um, like I say, I, I don't know what year it was. I think it might have been early 2000 where uh, resident, residential code changed where they inter interconnected all smoke alarms. So I apologize, I, I should know that, but I don't know that. Um, so where one goes off, they all go off. Um, but minimum decibel levels are 15 decibels. Um, in the commercial aspect of it and relating to like fire alarms, we do have smoke detectors which notify and activate notification appliances. Well, notification appliances will activate at much higher decibel levels than 15 to the point where you could be too loud. And if it's too loud, the idea there is if it's a screaming fire alarm system, you want people to be able to think, not be blasted with their eardrums with fire alarm systems. So 15 decibel has been proven to be able at high enough rate to wake somebody up in the dead of sleep. Cleaning. Um, if, you have a, if you have a dusty environment, um, the best and easiest way is just to take a vacuum up to it, suck off the um, smoke alarm and, and clean the sensors off. Um, they, you will get false alarms if your smoke detectors are too dusty. They won't activate. They'll be delayed if they're activated. Um, if there is a fire and they're too dusty, the smoke um, will just hit against that dust and actually hit the sensor. So it'll create a delay in your smoke alarm. And I've seen them to where they've been so dusty that your smoke alarm won't even activate. So um, cleaning them and regular maintenance is important. If it's not a dusty environment, maybe every so often, just check it just to see. Um, but I can tell, like during an investigation, I can tell by the smoke deposit and the carbon deposits on a working smoke detector if that was going off during the time of the fire. And what it'll do, the vibration of the sound diaphragm on the smoke detector will attract the smoke particulates and they'll stick to it. So that tells me the smoke alarm was activated. It's kind of neat. Um, but it's a definitely a telltale sign of that smoke detector working. Uh, monthly tests, good idea. But again, we go back to that same thing of like, every time we turn our clocks ahead or back, change your batteries. Um, nowadays, state law requires a 10 year um, smoke detector, which I believe have um, permanent batteries. So those smoke detectors are supposed to last for 10 years and the state of Oregon can't sell anything less than that now. Uh, that law, law passed a number of years ago, um, so which is great. But again, if you have home, smoke detectors that are over 10 years old, check it, replace them, because they get weak and they won't be as sensitive. Fire extinguishers. Um, there are numerous different types. Um, so we'll just briefly go over and mainly focus on the ones that would be important for you guys for around the home. So we have four different types. We have ordinary, flammable, Electrical equipment and exotic metals. Uh, your class A ordinary combustibles is what typically we see within our home. Not so much the garage, um, but within our home. That's just all of our lightweight material, wood, cotton products. Synthetic products are still considered ordinary combustibles, but they burn like gasoline, so it's kind of a balance. And that's where, like when we're looking at and choosing the right appropriate smoke or fire extinguisher, you wanna get an ABC extinguisher that has, covers all three different types of fuel loads. Flammable liquids, which is the class B. Uh, class C, which is electrical, which is gonna be like your dry chemical fire extinguishers. Cause you don't wanna put a wet chemical agent on it, you're gonna get electrocuted. Um, and then less common one is class D, which is exotic metals, which is like our magnesium 
uh, fires, which you put water on a magnesium fire, you've got a whole other problem, whole other issue to deal with. So class A is generally always your, just your water fire extinguisher, pressurized water can that you can buy, you can reuse it as much as you want, um, but it's generally only water. Class A fires, combustibles, paper, cardboard, stuff like that. Halon, um, Halon is still in existence. I don't believe it's sold much anymore because it turned out to be an ozone uh, destroying agent. So they've switched it now over to like a clean agent type uh, ex extinguishing ex expellent. Um, so Halon, it's kind of hard to come by these days, but those are mainly for electrical type fires. Uh, the idea with that is if we go back to our fire tetrahedron, it takes away the oxygen, it suffocates the fire uh, by displacing the oxygen in that environment. So it puts it out. Uh, CO2, which is a dry chemical extinguishing agent for class B and C fires, that creates more of like a blanket over the fire, which again takes away the oxygen. So if we have like a flammable liquids gasoline fire and we're expelling that CO2 agent onto the, onto the fire itself at the base, the chemical will work across that plane of the fire and pushing the oxygen out and suffocate the fire. And then class B foams, same thing, but foam is also water and it's a surfactant, has the same idea as a CO2 uh, extinguishing agent. So here's our most common uh, Home Depot, Lowe's. If you don't have one at home, go grab one. Um, definitely like to recommend a minimum uh, five pound extinguisher, um, which is probably the most common one that you see at these department stores. It gives you enough chemical to really actually do something to that fire. If you got those one, those little tiny two pounder little things, that's enough to probably like expel out there for about a couple seconds and then get out of dodge because the fire is going to keep going. Unless if you can see the fire in the very, very early stages. You get yourself like a five pound or 10 pound fire extinguisher. You can actually do some damage to that fire if not extinguish it. Um, and we'll go over how to use that, utilize that here in a second. But just make sure that it does say uh, A, B and C class fires. But there is a point where enough is too much to try to extinguish it yourself. And honestly, it kind of comes down to a comfort level, your experience, how quickly can you get out, how confident are you are to extinguish that fire. Um, but ultimately, just get out of the building and don't kill yourself over something of trying to fight something that's insured, that's gonna get replaced. Um, Extinguishers are very successful. Uh, we've had numerous fire saves with extinguishers, um, but we've also had some close calls that should have just been avoided. Um, so if you're, if you're somebody that can't get out very quickly, or if you're in a wheelchair, or if you're in a walker, just get out, just let it go. So, uh, let's see. Just a continuation of when not to use. Um, going back to and talking about some of our fire dynamics as it relates to some of our modern furniture with the full synthetic materials. Even if the fire is very small, let's go back to our awesome Ikea couch. Even if fire is very small, that is plastic, that is styrofoam, that's all kinds of toxic, horrible chemicals being put off by that fire. And that smoke is blacker than black when it comes burning off of that couch. You don't want to be standing in that either. And, how, and that smoke will get down to the floor before that fire is going to consume that, that room. Say it was like a living room. That whole room is going to be black, black smoke in seconds. This is where you don't want to be standing in that black smoke at all. It'll take you down and knock you down in seconds if you're standing up in it. Um, it's just not worth the risk. Um, especially, you know, there's circumstances where, yeah, you can probably try to extinguish it if your fire extinguisher was right there close to you. Um, but ultimately, it's just, just get out of the building. Um, fire is between you and your exit. I would spend more time trying to figure out where you're gonna go versus trying to figure out how to extinguish that fire. Um, seconds matter. 
Um, so a third of the burn injuries come from attempts to extinguish a fire, and that's 100% true. Uh, as we try to be our own heroes, you know, save our cats, save our pets. It's a, it's a hard one to juggle when you're in that position, but ultimately you got to get out. Um, so how long an, ex an extinguisher will last really depends on the person using it. You could take a five pound extinguisher, pull the nozzle, squeeze the handle, point the nozzle at the fire, at the base of the fire, and it's probably only gonna last 15 to 20 seconds. That's how much you, time you have to work with when you fully activate a five pound extinguisher. You can go through bursts um, and try to extinguish the fire. Just depends on who the user is and the confidence level of using that extinguisher. Um, grease fires um, can go back to unattended cooking, but grease fires, um, if you have a dry chemical extinguisher near you, is a good thing to use on a grease fire. Also the best thing to do is just cover it up, take away that ignition source. Don't Look to see if the fire is still burning. <laughs> I've done that. And you can still see it smoldering underneath there. And then as soon as you take that lid off, it whoosh. And yeah. So keep the lid on it. Just leave it there. The fire isn't going to go anywhere. Um, or you can smother it with like a, a wet towel. Get the towel not soaking wet. This is risky, but get the towel a little bit wet. Cover it. It'll smother out the fire. But don't get it soaking wet because we know water and grease explode when they come into contact with each other, especially if it's on fire. Um, how do I get out after using the extinguisher? Uh, that's kind of a weird question, but um, prior to that, using the extinguisher, if you're gonna use the extinguisher and put yourself in a little bit more risk to the circumstances that are going on, find your, find your second exit first before you try to extinguish the fire. If you're confident enough, then go extinguish the fire um, and look for your other way out. So it's easier said than done, especially with people that may not have experienced as much fire as I have in the last 30 years or, you know, or has the confidence level to take on something like that. Usually from our experiences, people are, are in a horrible state of stress. They're freaking out. And the best thing is just get out, don't even mess with it, and save yourself. Um, let's see, for, it kind of goes into a little bit of commercial stuff, but for home fire extinguishers, inspecting it annually, just looking at it. Um, if you've got one that has a metal top, those are serviceable by a company, if you choose. Um, honestly, if it's still in the green, you're probably going to be okay. Back in the day, that dry chemical agent used to settle on the bottom. You flip it over, you tap on it, flip it back over, and shake it up a little bit. Anymore, you don't have to do that. Um, but for residential, there is no requirement that requires you to service your fire extinguisher annually like we do impose on businesses throughout our community. Um, but it is a good idea to move it around every once in a while just to see if it's still working, see if it's still in the green. Um, if it's not and you haven't used it, it's got a leak somewhere, it's probably best just to replace it and it's probably cheaper just to replace it. Go, to, go back to Lowe's or Home Depot and get a new one. Um, many questions or many times we get questions regarding uh, what do we do with old fire extinguishers. Take them down to Metro uh, Transfer Station at the Hazmat facility and they will take them right away and dispose of it for you. Um, I won't go into this other stuff. That's this more commercial stuff. Not so much residential. Um, okay, just a couple more uh, slides here. But if never you've experienced any type of training on how to use a fire extinguisher, we call it pass. We pull, aim, squeeze, sweep. You'll grab an extinguisher, pull the pin that's in there. Sometimes they'll have a plastic lock or a plastic mechanism. That's just so people don't accidentally, the pin doesn't accidentally slide out and somebody pushes the handle and expels it. Keeps it in place, but you pull the pin break that seal, you're gonna aim the nozzle at the base of the fire. If you aim it at the top of the fire where the fire is going, you're not gonna do a thing to that fire. The only way to extinguish that fire, and this is exactly what fire crews do, they always attack a fire at the base. You, you're, you attack the fire where it's coming from and where the fuel load is. As Soon as you extinguish that, everything else, it might smolder, but it's gonna extinguish itself. 
uh, in some cases. But biggest thing is you attack the fire always at the base. Um, squeeze the handle. Like I was saying, you can, depending upon what the circumstances is, either you're going to fully uh, depress the lever, which your chemical is going to come out much faster than if you're just going to do spurts or bursts. But for that circumstance, fully depress the, the lever, and you're going to do a sweeping pattern at the base of that fire. Um, eight to 10 feet is recommended um, of being that close to the fire. All depends on how big the fire is. If you're eight to 10 feet, you can probably and confidently do a lot of damage to extinguishing that fire with a five to 10 pound fire extinguisher. If you're having to step back 15, 20, 30 feet because it's super hot and there's a lot of flames, just get out. <laughs> Cause you're not, your extinguisher isn't gonna put that fire out. And especially if you've never put a fire out with an extinguisher, you can try, but the likelihood of you're, you're just gonna slow it down a little bit for a couple seconds and it's just best just to get out. So up close, eight to 10 feet, um, aggressively attack the fire with your extinguisher, you probably can get that fire extinguished. Okay, and then last slide. So um, the fire district a number of years ago uh, started a program, program called the Fire of Life. Um, I'll give you guys some and I can leave some here too so residents have them. Um, it's a very critical and easy tool for emergency responders to take a look at, especially with fire, first arriving fire crew, then right behind them is AMR, um, that they can take a look at, see what your medical histories are so they know a better approach to how to treat you. And the more information they have, uh, the better the outcome is gonna be. So I will leave some here, um, but good locations to place them is either on the refrigerator, in the kitchen somewhere, someplace visible so that if they walk in or your bedroom, someplace visible uh, somebody, where that can just be handed right off to uh, emergency responders. So um, I will, I've got about 25 of them, but I'll leave some here. And pretty much everything I've covered is located on our public website at clackmasfire.com. So um, if anybody has any questions.